You're listening to Ask the Expert on Sprott Money News. Hello and welcome to this week's Ask the Expert here on Sprott Money News. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford, and on the line with me today, we have Mr. John Williams. John Williams is an economic consultant with over 30 years' worth of experience in private consulting and government economic reporting. His website, shadowstats.com, is an electronic newsletter service dedicated to exposing and analyzing flaws in current U.S. government economic data and provides an assessment of underlying economic and financial conditions Net of Financial Market and Political Hype. So with that, we'd like to welcome our guest today on Ask the Expert, Mr. John Williams. Hello, John. Uh, Hello, Jeff. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate that today. So, John, we've had a number of uh, questions being sent in from our, our listeners. A lot of obviously pertaining to what's been happening as far as uh, inflation, uh, likewise as far as what's been happening as far as current uh, economic policies. So let's uh, try and see if we can uh, get into this. So, John, so while the USA is having much higher unemployment and bigger deficits than before, the rest of the world, when we look at China, Japan, or even Europe, are doing much worse. So long as the rest of the world continues to be much worse than the USA, the status quo can continue. So in other words, what is there that can change this so that it's not necessarily detrimentally affecting the U.S. dollar and the economy? Okay. Well, I'd, I'd argue with the, some of the premises that you put forth in terms of the relative uh, strength of the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, economic and, and financial conditions. In fact, I think uh, the U.S., particularly when you consider that it's the uh, it's still the dominant economy, certainly from a financial standpoint in the world, um, we never recovered from the uh, um, the so-called recession of 2007. We just uh, had a plunge in protection, and now the economy is so weak that um, the uh, a new downturn is showing up even in official reporting. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing that I work with is the, uh, uh, the, the estimation of the government statistics, uh, the, the way they used to be reported before, uh, various changes were made by the government and methodology that generally put upside economic biases into the economic reporting and downside uh, biases into, into inflation. Right. And um, I'll contend that re- reality, uh, common experience would show uh, a much weaker economy, much higher unemployment, much much much, much higher inflation. Mm-hmm. But separate from those factors, all of which on a relative basis are very important in terms of the the value of the dollar, you, you have some other factors as well, such as uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the the relative political stability. Um, I always uh, found in, when I was involved in trading currencies that uh, if you looked at the positive rating of the U.S. president mm-hmm. by the American people, that's a pretty good indicator as to how uh, the political system was uh, viewed domestically and, and in the rest of the world. And right now we have something close to a dysfunctional government and being able to get things done. People are very upset with the government. Uh, that's that's a big negative against the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at the uh, our fiscal conditions, uh, officially the uh, numbers are getting uh, better, but if you look at on a, on a gap basis using generally accepted accounting principles, the way a, a corporation would uh, re- report its uh, financial statements, we're seeing annual deficits, a deficit in order of magnitude six trillion dollars. Right. Um, that's uh, that's a third of uh, that's a third of the GDP. And if you looked at the um, aggregate obligations, again using gap accounting, uh, we're looking at something that's over ninety trillion dollars. It's fifteen times the level of GDP. It's a type of thing that the United States uh, can never. Um, resolve with normal economic and financial policies. The government has to address its long-term solvency issues if it's if it's going to survive, if it's going to have any credibility in the rest of the world. The global markets look at the U.S. and there's a big question of that uh, the, the, the sovereign uh, solvency. We, we saw the concerns about of that uh, come to a head back in August of. Uh, uh, 2011, when S&P downgraded the U.S. Treasuries, mm-hmm. and you you had a, a brief dollar panic before there was massive intervention, and a variety of things were done by central banks to try and calm things down. Um, we have ahead of us here probably the worst fundamentals ever facing the dollar. I don't think the 
for the U.S. dollar against the rest of the world major Western currencies, including the Canadian dollar, mm-hmm. um, I don't think things have ever been more negative. So not only do you have, do you have problems on the fiscal front, uh, which I'd be happy to go into further detail with, you have uh, problems on the monetary front with the Federal Reserve. Mm-hmm. Um, the Fed, uh, well, let, let me just back up a, a, a point or two. Um, we had a financial panic in uh, 2008. Mm-hmm. Uh, people in Washington were saying, oh my goodness, we're within a day or two of a collapse of the banking system. Well, they, they, they weren't kidding. They really were. We should not have gotten to that point. There are all sorts of reasons that we were there. Never should have happened, but we were there. Right. And what happened was uh, the federal government, the Federal Reserve, um, they, they did everything that they could, everything that they had to. Uh, they created whatever money was needed. They bailed out large firms. Uh, whatever was needed to prevent um, a collapse of the financial system was undertaken, mm-hmm. irrespective of the long-term implications of those actions. And uh, what they did was that they, they didn't resolve the problem. They pushed all the issues into the future. We're in the future now. Exactly. We're still sitting in a, in a circumstance that we could see the issues. In fact, we'll see the issues of the, the panic of um, 2008 uh, re- resurface here. The economy still is in trouble. The, the banks are still in trouble. And as the economy deepens, we're now seeing that happen uh, as, a, as a downturn deepens. We're now seeing the first quarter um, uh, U.S. GDP uh, showing a reasonably uh, large decline. I'll contend, despite the, uh, the, the hype and optimism on Wall Street about the second quarter, that we're going to see a second quarter uh, contraction in official reporting. That will give you a, a new recession, as most people would define it. And that's not commonly viewed. That, that's a factor that could, could trigger massive selling against the dollar. Right. The right. economy, the, um, the fiscal conditions. And then it was getting back to the Fed, what they did was they did whatever they had to to support the banking system. The U.S. Federal Reserve is not an agent of the uh, U.S. government. It's a private corporation owned by the commercial banks. Right. Its primary function in life is to keep the banking system afloat, to keep it solvent. It has a mandate from the government to keep the economy growing and, and, and to contain inflation. But there's very little the Fed can do at this point to stimulate the economy um, or, or, for that matter, to uh, uh, contain inflation. The way to contain inflation usually is to drive the economy into the ground, and that will normally bring down uh, inflation. That's what, that's what uh, Volcker did uh, a couple of decades back. Right. But you have a circumstance here where the... Um, the economy has already been driven into the ground. You, you, you don't have the ability to do that. So that all the all the things that were, all the actions that were taken back in 2008 had inflationary implications. Those are still to play out. If you look at the deficit side of it, um, the circumstances there have doomed the U.S. Uh, dollar to a long-term hyperinflation. And I'm looking at a hyperinflation here. Where the dollar becomes virtually U.S. dollar becomes virtually worthless, or absolutely worthless as, mm-hmm. as a currency, having no 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 per, no purchasing power. Um, that could have happened the end of this decade, but the crisis in 2008 and what we're still doing now accelerated the process. Now the Fed has uh, indeed has pulled back on its uh, quantitative easing, and the markets uh, some in the markets have taken relief from that. Um, others are distressed about it. The issue with the quantitative easing was never economic stimulus. It was to support the banking system. The banking system still is in trouble. Right. Um, what the what the Fed did was it used the weak economy and still is use, using the the weak economy as political cover um, to to try and help the banks. I, I don't know that I wouldn't do differently if I were running the Fed, but that's that's not exactly uh, up front with the American people. Right. And um, so even though there's been some tapering now with the new Fed chairman, as the economy weakens anew, uh, all of a sudden you're going to have more and more calls for the Fed to introduce more quantitative easing. I, I think they're going to do that fairly soon, despite you know all the talk of the tapering and when are they going to try to hike, hike interest rates. They're, they're, they're going to be forced back into that, not because of the 
weakening economy, again, that's the political cover, mm -hmm. but because of the problems this creates in the banking system and the, the, the liquidity issues there. So that's, um, uh, that, that's a tremendous uh, um, uh, factor. Right. If you um, look at our trade deficit, it's widening. That's part of the problem with the, uh, uh, the, the, the declining GDP. Uh, you put these factors together, you have an extraordinarily negative environment for the U.S. dollar against the rest of the world. You're going to have surprises in the market, such as uh, a negative second quarter GDP. It may take a revision or two to get it there, but it's going to happen. Under these circumstances, one morning give you a real sharp decline in the U.S. dollar, and if you get a panic, which would be where this is uh, uh, eventually heading, there's not too much that can be done with intervention there, and that's the type of thing that will trigger um, the early stages of a hyperinflation. Right. Keep in mind that as the dollar weakens, and I'm talking this now from the standpoint of the United States. So, John, don't mean to cut you off there. So, we're looking at hyperinflation. So, are, are these the signs that we're looking for as far as that's concerned? Well, um, as I'm looking at it at this point in time, uh, the, the early stages, of the, the signal that you'll see, that what you have to watch out for is an extraordinarily sharp decline in the dollar, panic selling of the, of the dollar. Okay. Um, and and in response to that, you'll see a rally in uh, commodity prices um, in in U.S. dollar terms, such as uh, for oil. Um, within the U.S. economy, there's no no uh, single factor uh, that, that's a, a, a greater booster of inflation. And in terms of when when you start to see the hyperinflation, um, you'll, you'll know it when you see it. Prices will be rising rapidly. You say, whoa, well, you know what's what's happening here. It happens. It happens very quickly, mm -hmm. um, but the the warning signal will be the a massive decline in the U.S. dollar. People look at the money supply, and um, we don't have a high inflationary environment right now, mm -hmm. where the official inflation is a little over two percent. Um, if you adjust out the um, all the methodological problems of the last or um, methodological issues of the last couple of decades. Um, you're running closer to nine percent instead of two percent. Mm -hmm. What what the government did um, was twofold. In the way it changed uh, the, the the basic CPI, our our consumer price index, the broadest measure, <coughs> broadest measure of inflation, variations of which are used in adjusting social security payments. Alan Greenspan ex expressed it well back in uh, the night early 1990s. He said, "Oh." The consumer price index overstates inflation. If only it were more accurate and we got a lower inflation number there, it would enable us to make lower adjustments mm -hmm. to the uh, cost of living adjustments. It would help us cut the deficit. Mm -hmm. And the, um, you'd ask him, well, how is the CPI overstating inflation? Mm -hmm. His response would be along the lines that, well, let's say steak gets too expensive. More and more people will buy hamburger. If they buy more hamburger, it's costing them less it's a lower cost of living. That's not the way inflation has been measured historically, nor if you're looking at it as an individual, the way you want to have it measured. If you're looking at a, the rate of inflation, you're looking at it uh, usually from the standpoint of personal interest. How much should my wages go up so I uh, stay even or my salary? Or if I'm looking at an investment, what's the minimum minimal return I need here in order to be, beat inflation? Mm hmm that's not what the government's giving anymore. It used to be a very simple measure. It was against a fixed basket of goods. It was a measure of um, the cost of living, of maintaining a constant standard of living. Mm -hmm. So that if steak prices went up, your income went up enough so you could buy steak instead of having to buy, buy hamburger. Mm -hmm. The new system that they're trying to put in, and they're still working on it, they, they, they completely bastardized the uh, CPI index they've made it the quasi substitution index. They want a substitution index where it reflects how people are forced to spend their money as opposed to how they'd like to spend their money mm -hmm. to maintain a constant standard of living. The other thing is the consumer price index no longer reflects what you spend out of pocket. And the reason for that is that uh, the government makes unusual quality adjustments. They call them hedonic adjustments where they... they tend to reduce the level of inflation to reflect improvements in, 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 in quality. Now, there are certain elements 
or for, for changes in changes in quality. Mm-hmm. And there are very legitimate areas where that needs to be done. For example, um, and they, they send out people to to go around the stores to uh, sample the goods that are being sold at what price. Let's say one month you have a candy bar that's uh, eight ounces in size. Mm-hmm. The next month the candy bar is packaged in the same size package, but it's a six ounce bar. Right. You're not getting the same thing for your money. They actually they, they will measure that. They'll adjust accordingly in, in the price index. Right. But let's say you're a student with uh, you're buying textbooks uh, for, um, for for your uh, semester, and um, they'll determine that if you, your your books include color pictures, that's really a quality element that needs to be reduced from the the the, the, the pricing of, of of your goods. Right. The, the, one, one of the most extreme examples, and it was early on with the concept. The federal government in the United States mandated uh, changes to gasoline formulation to improve emissions. And when it was put into effect, it had the, it, it boosted uh, the price of the gasoline pump by 10 cents uh, a gallon. Mm-hmm. That was, at the time, that was quite a big boost. Right. But it didn't get reflected in the consumer price index. The reason being was that the government viewed that as a quality improvement. But I can tell you, and I, I was one of the guys doing that, Pumping, pumping the gas into your car, you're not standing there saying, well, I'm spending an extra 10 cents a gallon here to get better air. You're moaning and groaning, oh, gee, you look how, how much my, uh, how much more expensive, expensive it is now for me to drive to work right. because the price of gasoline went up. Right. The measure that the government gives you does not reflect your out-of-pocket expenses. It's what, it's, it's what it deems mathematically is appropriate with quality adjustment for the quality adjustments that the government says is there. Mm-hmm. So that you look at the changes over the uh, period since 1980, based on what the Bureau of Labor Statistics has published, there's uh, seven percentage points of annual inflation growth that have been knocked off the CPI by all these changes, and um, that, that's why the uh, that's why um, the rate of inflation at two percent that they report is effectively nonsense. I think most people here would. Uh, um, agree that uh, inflation is uh, actual inflation is higher than what gets reported by the government. I have some people argue with me that the adjustment may, I make is uh, too much. Um, I, I'm not going to get into big arguments with people there, but the point is that it is uh, it's a lot higher than what the government publishes. And if you accept the government's number at face value uh, for making any decisions, you're 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 in, you're in bad trouble. Right. So now that you kind of painted a picture of what um, a hyperinflationary scenario would look like in the U.S., on the Canadian side, what would happen, John, to, to the Canadian dollar? Would we have to respond in kind with a large devaluation in order to protect our exports to our largest trading partner? Can we actually raise interest rates above those in the U.S.? I, I, I would doubt it because I don't think you'd want to follow the U.S. to where it's going to be going here. Mm-hmm. Um, with a hyperinflation, um, now let me just use the example of Zimbabwe, which I know most people have uh, heard stories about. Or you, know, you take a, uh, an original two dollar bill in their system and take what it would have been a two dollar bill equivalent in the last iteration of their currency and just piled up enough two dollar bills from the final iteration against the original one to equal one of the old. Um, you'd have a pile of currency that went from here to the Andromeda galaxy. Um, I'm looking for something of a rough equivalent. I, I don't know that it's, it'll go as far as Zimbabwe did. It'll go as far enough that the uh, U.S. dollar will be virtually worthless. People will not be spending U.S. dollars, I'm talking now in the United States, mm-hmm. when they go to buy a loaf of bread. They're going to end up with some kind of a uh, barter system. But there's going to be a, a very rough period before any kind of a barter system might come into place. Right. Where you could have um, uh, d- d- disruptions to the delivery of uh, goods and services like, 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 like groceries. It'll tend to push the U.S. economy and domestic demand into uh, probably the uh, worst depression we've ever seen. And as such, uh, the U.S. is not going to be a real good trading partner for anyone. Mm-hmm. For well, now when the U.S. economy sinks badly, and I'm effectively looking at a hyperinflationary Great Depression here, um, you have a uh, the, 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 you can't take something that's a little shy of half the world's economy and shut it down and uh, 
not expect the rest of the world to uh, uh, feel economic pain, particularly Canada. As you, uh, I think you mentioned uh, Canada is our uh, biggest trading partner. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you want to maintain your your domestic solvency. I view the I view the Canadian dollar as a relative safe haven for people in the United States who are holding U.S. dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, mean, I said to people, say, how do I preserve my wealth and assets? How do I preserve the purchasing power of my assets? I, I tell them to look at uh, hard assets like such as physical gold and, and silver and to get some uh, currency, uh, U.S. dollar currency, outside the U.S. dollar, uh, currency such as the Canadian dollar, right. the Australian dollar, and the Swiss franc. I, I look at the Canadian dollar as a safe haven here. You, I think you'll avoid the hyperinflation. It's going to be very difficult to avoid in, uh, uh, sympathetic economic impact from the United States where you have such a trade relationship. On the other hand, I've always found the, the private trade sector, uh, the private sector to be extraordinarily creative. And uh, I know you're already, uh, as, uh, you're already expanding exports to uh, so timber to China and whatever. You will find ways and other trading partners to ride through well, what's going to be a difficult economic time, probably uh, broaden your, your uh, horizons as a result. But the, um, in terms of the United States, it's, it's going to be a, a very difficult time until such time as a currency can be stabilized. Uh, I don't know how long that's going to be, what it's going to take, how, it, how it's going to go. Right. Once, you, once you get into that type of a circumstance, there are all sorts of things that could happen. Uh, when the dollar, I mean, the, the, the dollar or some currency will have to be reintroduced. Um, given the scope of the dollar in the uh, the, the, the current system, um, as part of the hyperinflation, the dollar debasement, dumping of the dollar, I would expect that you would see a um, uh, the loss of uh, uh, reserve status global reserve status for the U.S. dollar, right. which will tend to, to accelerate the process. But wh- whatever the currency system is that follows, my betting would be you, it'll have some component of precious metals in it, uh, particularly gold, to help um, give people confidence in it. Right. I have people who today will say, well, all we have to do is put the U.S. on a gold standard and we'll be fine and dandy. Uh, not so. It is... Uh, there's a big problem here that's got to be addressed first. If the U.S. just uh, adopt to the gold standard today, the gold standard would put a cap on, on the government spending. Um, but that's uh, we don't have any uh, we don't have a government that's able to uh, uh, do that at present. The way things are set, we've got tremendous deficits going forward. Again, on a on a gap accounting basis, order of magnitude six trillion dollars per year. Mm-hmm. Um, if that's in place, if we, if we uh, the United States went on a gold standard, we'd be constantly devaluing the dollar against gold. It would have the same effect as the as the inflation. For a gold a gold standard to work, mm-hmm. the U.S. has to balance its fiscal condition. It has to address its long term solvency issues. The global markets are looking at that. Um, they were looking at it uh, to the point of panicking or uh, dumping the dollar. Back in 2011, they've given the U.S. Now, let's go back to the panic of 2008. We're, we're six years, six years down the road from that. The U.S. has done absolutely nothing to address its long-term solvency issues, and the rest of the world knows it. The patience is running out. You get have a more vocal chorus of um, friends and foes alike in uh, the, the global markets who are uh, moving away from the dollar. They'd like to get out of the dollar. They're holding dollars. Uh, because uh, they, they 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 don't want to uh, be part of the trigger of a of, of of a renewed panic, but wait till somebody starts selling, and you you have to rush out that door. That's when you get, you're going to get a, a massive sell off, and um, the nature of a massive sell off is one that the, there's nothing much the central banks can do with intervention to stabilize it. Right. Right. So, I mean, we've talked about uh, inflation. We kind of uh, touched upon deflation as well, John. So. As we look over the last, I think the last few years now, President Obama has been saying that he's been lowering the deficit. So is this possible? And if it is true, why is the debt increasing if this is the case? Well, again, it depends how you're defining the the deficit. You go back 
pre-crisis is a simple cash-based uh, system, cash in versus cash out. Mm-hmm. No accrual accounting, where, where you allow for money that hasn't been spent or money that hasn't been received in terms of figuring out how you, how you did. Um, after all the bailouts, they changed the cash accounting to some kind of a quasi uh, gimmicked accounting where they started uh, accounting for so called investments, um, including, let's say, the bailouts of uh, the mortgage, uh, federal mortgage giants, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Mm-hmm. Uh, the U.S. effectively took them over. Normal accounting principles, uh, you'd consolidate them into the, the U.S. Uh, financial statements if you did. The U.S. financial statements would look a lot better. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot worse. Okay. Uh, but what has happened is that um, using accounting gimmicks, in terms of uh, credit that uh, Fannie, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have on their federal income tax now because of uh, these losses that they've had, although they're owned by the government, um, that then becomes an asset. And from that, they've been able to declare dividends. And, and pay dividends to the U.S. government, which has helped to reduce the cash deficit in, 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 in the near term. But we have had some higher taxes. We have had uh, uh, some effects of sequestration. Um, but right now the economy is slowing. Uh, the gimmicks are running thin. And uh, I'd ex- I expect you're going to see a significant deepening of the cash-based deficit mm-hmm. um, in, the, uh, in, in the year ahead. Um, all the projections that you get on the on the deficit out of the federal government are on a cash basis. It's not not the generally accepted accounting principles where you look at the uh, uh, unfunded liabilities for Social Security and Medicare and such. It's just cash in, cash out, plus a couple of uh, plus a couple of gimmicks. Mm-hmm. But everything that they have going forward is based on uh, positive economic growth, assumptions of positive economic growth. We're not going to have that, and, and we're already beginning to see that. So as the expectations drop on the economy, um, expectations on the deficit will widen, expectations of the U.S. Treasury needing to uh, borrow money will widen. And guess what? Mm-hmm. The, Federal, the uh, Federal Reserve is buying up uh, 70% of the uh, net uh, U.S. Treasury is- issuance. Um, that's what the, even with their uh, tapered... Uh, um, expansion of, of, of uh, quantitative easing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it almost makes you think that they're worried uh, the Treasury might not be able to uh, to, to sell its uh, sell its debt. The effect is that it keeps the interest rates artificially low. Uh, the effect is that it scares the uh, foreign investors and scares them about inflation because usually there is an inflationary impact or there will be. Wait till the rest of the world dumps its dollars. But you have to consider the, the, the money supply, which eventually will drive the uh, uh, inflation picture here. Right. Is that um, where we have maybe $15 trillion uh, of blood money supply, what used to be called M3. I still track it. Um, the Fed stopped publishing it in 2006, but you can put it together by looking at their, at their other numbers. And some of the components they publish along with their estimates of them, too. Um, long story as to why they uh, did that, but the, the broader the money supply measure, the better the indicator you have of what's, what, what's happening in, in the system. And if you go beyond um, what's in the domestic system, that, that's money supply uh, basically in the, in the uh, banking system, financial system in the United States, um, you have an even greater amount that is sitting outside the United States in the hands of uh, uh, both uh, domestic and but primarily foreign and foreign investors. And um, it is that pool of uh, liquidity that would be uh, increasingly dumped in a, in a dollar panic and flow back into the United States, put the Fed in that position mm-hmm. where it either has to absorb uh, all that or let the markets crash. They'll be uh, they'll be uh, they'll be pumping in uh, tremendous amounts of liquidity, and that's that's it is it is through that uh, panic selling of the dollar and and the resulting effects of trying to hold the system together that you start to see a big spike in the money supply. But you'll see it directly reflected in things such as the price of uh, gasoline at the gasoline pump, 
and and you'll find movement uh, along with that again to uh, have the U.S. dollar removed as a uh, key uh, world reserve currency, exacerbating the inflation problem. Okay. So if the world decides to go on a new currency system like SDRs, what impact do you expect this to have on the U.S. economy and your own statistical reporting like your inflation report? Well, in terms of the uh, economy, it would be a negative for both the U.S. economy and for uh, domestic inflation. Uh, in the same way, it'll I mean, effectively be, use, be losing the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency. Uh, I mean, the dollar will be presumably pegged, it will vary some against the uh, SDR rate, but uh, if that were the system, oil would be uh, priced in this. SDRs and uh, it generally would um, the, the dollar would not hold the uh, there would not be the demand for the dollar that you have now mm-hmm. um, and again as the uh, if people moved out of the dollar I'd expect you to continue downside pressure in the dollar and inflationary pressures. In terms of uh, uh, my reporting, basically I look at the uh, my, my reporting is based on what what the Bureau of Labor Statistics puts out. Okay. They go, they go around, they measure prices every month, and then they put out an index, and they, they have all sorts of manipulations they do. Assuming they continue to do that, I would continue to publish my version of what they put out. And um, I, I don't I don't recalculate all the internal components. What, what, I, what I do basically is look at the changes they've made and take their estimates of the changes they've made and the impact they have and add that back in. Okay. So it'll, it, my, my my numbers, I, I would continue to publish as long as the Bureau of Labor Statistics is published. Mm-hmm. Um, they do that in the hyperinflation. I, I I think they'll just get blown away. And it's, they, they 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 couldn't report it fast enough. Right. And and there's something also here you ought to consider too, for people who are looking to invest in something like um, inflation based bonds, the tips as they have them in the United States. Although they'll, um, uh, in theory, they get uh, cashed out to adjust for the uh, the consumer price index. When things get really bad in terms of the hyperinflation, they can't adjust fast enough to make this uh, th- this worthwhile. Right. If you look at the um, some stories, for example, that came out of the Weimar Republic back in the 20s, uh, the, the inflation was so rapid that you could go into a um, a restaurant. At night, order a fine dinner, expensive bottle of wine. The next morning, that bottle of wine would be worth more as scrap glass than it had been worth uh, the night before filled, filled with an expensive wine. Right, right. The Treasury can't adjust that quickly, so whatever um, advantages you would have that they actually could measure, there's just no time to get it to you and and, and to have it function. And, and there's that, that, that brings you to another issue. And then we we have tremendous volatility in the uh, precious metals prices. Uh, that's usually tied to uh, central bank intervention. Mm-hmm. Um, but you have a circumstance here. I don't care if you get uh, gold at uh, five hundred an ounce, a thousand an ounce, ten thousand an ounce. Whatever you get it, it's the type of thing that, that I advocate to people uh, in the United States looking to preserve the wealth and assets. This is your basic hedge. Right. This is what you need to ride out the storm. Now, I'm, I may not have the timing on the storm perfect. If you have this when it hits, you, you could see gold at $100,000 an ounce U.S. Could be a million. Eventually, it could be a billion as, as the dollar loses its value. Right. It's not that you're seeing, wow, I've made a million bucks um, you know, holding my gold. Mm-hmm. That's uh, what, what you're seeing there is what the purchasing power is of the assets that, that you put into the gold. Right. Had you not put the 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 money into the gold, that's what you would have lost. Right. Right. In in terms of purchasing power, so that's uh, just an aside. So now let's look, let's stick with uh, precious metals here. I mean, obviously we're on spot money. This is what we do. Um, so John, so back in two thousand eight, gold fell from one thousand fifteen dollars an ounce to six hundred and eighty dollars an ounce. Likewise, silver also dropped from twenty one dollars an ounce down to nine dollars an ounce. Right. So so what caused this drop in the price of gold and silver? Do you see gold and silver following that trend and following that much this year as well? Well working in reverse sequence there, um, you you're gonna have ongoing volatility and until you get into uh, until you get into the massive selling of the dollar and the the uh, 
early roots of the hyperinflation, and that's just generally going to be moving wildly to the upside. Generally, I, I look for it to continue to move higher, but uh, I'm not a day-to-day a, a timer, and you, you, you may have some ups and downs, mm-hmm. um, and we've certainly seen them. But what happened back in 2008 was uh, the drop-off there was uh, a direct function of the global financial panic and central bank intervention. Uh, these these guys are, and I'm referring kindly here to the central bankers, were in a very difficult circumstance, and, and they again, they did whatever they had to do to try and stabilize the system. Uh, they, they didn't want people fleeing to uh, uh, gold and silver. Um, that was a, when you see gold prices rise, generally it's it's a it's a, uh, a vote of no confidence in the central banks, mm-hmm. and that they know that. So that, that is, particularly when things are dicey, they they, they bristled with the private sector uh, rallying the, the gold price. Back after the crash, stock market crash in the United States in uh, 1987. President Reagan set up a uh, working group on the financial markets, presidential working group on the financial markets. Some people call it the plunge protection team. Mm-hmm. Headed uh, jointly or with varying uh, degrees by the Fed chairman and or the uh, Treasury secretary. And the, the mission ostensibly is to keep markets orderly. Right. Um, it has evolved to more than that where it's been used to move markets in uh, whatever directions have been uh, been needed. And, and you had Alan Greenspan talk about that uh, once. It's not discussed much. Right. Um, but with the uh, invasion of uh, Iraq looming at one point, everyone knew that we were going to invade Iraq, but nobody knew just what. And when it happened, it was expected there'd be uh, uh, financial reactions, um, gold, uh, gold prices, oil prices, uh, dollar. And... Um, the Fed, of course, was uh, made aware of when this was going to happen, and they moved in and they intervened in all sorts of markets, including the oil market and the gold market. Mm-hmm. They can do that. They're authorized to do that. The precedent has been set. You see these strange, uh, massive selling uh, sprees of uh, uh, gold in the uh, cash market. That's not the way a, uh, an investor usually would, would sell. That would. That's a good way to lose lose money. That's, those the sellings there clearly were intended by someone to uh, uh, drive the, uh, the, the price of uh, the precious metals lower. And um, you, you look at who has the biggest interest there, you've got a pretty good idea where the pressure's coming from. Mm-hmm. You may have further of that, but the long-term trend here is uh, to the upside. Gold is the only investment class, the only asset class that has held its uh, value, its purchasing power, mm-hmm. over the millennia. Right. I mean, you could buy a loaf of bread in uh, uh, Rome for about as much gold as you could uh, buy a loaf of bread today. Right. And that's that's where uh, this uh, gold and silver mm-hmm. uh, have have uh, have extraordinary value in terms as in terms of a hedge against uh, the, the rest of the world going crazy and and having what you have in the way of paper dollars being uh, made worthless. Right. So, I mean, even if you look at that, John, like in, in terms of precious metals now, again, sticking with that, that idea, so in July, when the new offshore banking laws take effect, do you see a major move in precious metals? Again, I'm not into day-to-day timing, but uh, my betting would be that uh, most of that effect has already been uh, worked into the market. Right. Well, John, we thank you again for uh, joining us here today. We've been speaking to John Williams, who's an economic consultant for over 30 years worth of experience in private consulting and government economic reporting. His website, again, is shadowstats.com, and it's an electronic newsletter dedicated to exposing and analyzing flaws in the U.S. government, economic data, and provides an assessment of underlying economic and financial conditions, net of financial market and political hype. And with that being said, John, we'd like to thank you again for joining us here on Ask the Expert here on Sprout Money. Again, Jeff, uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, John. And to our listeners, thank you for listening. Be sure to go to SproutMoney.com for more information. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Have a great day. Mm-hmm.